Well, welcome, Paul Hanberry, to In Conversation With. Thank you so much for joining me today. No problem. It's a pleasure. <laughs> nice to see you. It's been, what has it been, like maybe a year since I've actually seen you? I think so, yeah. I think um, the last time I saw you, I was um, sat in the sunshine outside a, a very nice restaurant in LA. And you're yep. wondering, I think for your mum, actually, if I remember. But. Yeah, it could have been. Or prior to maybe even in Melbourne, Melbourne GP. Oh, of course, yes. Then there was the Melbourne GP. Can't forget Melbourne GP. Yes. And how have you been? How's life in lockdown in the UK? Well, it, it, it's been, I guess, like for everybody, it's a, a, bit of a, a bit of a challenge, a mental challenge, that's for sure. Um, I'm lucky, if I'm really honest, no complaints. I've got a garden. Um, I've got, like, when the sun's out, I can get out there, uh, okay. get some fresh air. Well, you know, I say that because you can imagine people living in, in the inner cities, living in, uh, you know, apartment blocks, nowhere to go. I, I think for them, it must, I, I can't even imagine, you know, what, what suffering they've been going through. Absolutely. As well, and maybe worrying about their jobs uh, and their futures. So it's, yeah. um, you know, for me. In yeah. gen well, for you, for someone, if, you know, for everyone who's watching, you were the Formula One motorsport director for Pirelli and you worked for, within the Pirelli Institute, shall we say, for 27 years, Paul. Yeah, maybe 27, yeah, that's a long time, isn't that's it? That's quite the like, career. Uh, that's, yeah, it, it, it really scares me when I actually think about that. I mean, <laughs> I, was, I was very fortunate. It felt like lots of different careers because I did quite a lot of different things. Yeah, um, and the, the last uh, element yeah. of, of that career you were in South America was that's, that's right. right. I was in Brazil. I was president of the Latin American operations, so looking after five factories, thirteen thousand people, a huge, great business. Very different from the rest of the world that I've worked in. I, I mean, I spent most of my career in Europe, in US, and in Asia, based out of Singapore. So uh, I was very fortunate. Travelled the world, and then with the motorsport. Really traveled the world. Yeah. yeah 250 nights a year in hotels. And plus meeting. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. In Los Angeles of all places. But tell yeah. me, in terms of your career path, what got you into motorsport? Was it a love of motorsport or was it from a business perspective and it just happened to stem into motorsport? Well, I mean, motorsport in the UK is, is, is pretty much ingrained in society. It's mm -hmm. something that, you know, we're well known throughout the world of being a, a, hot, a hot pot, if you like, of, of the motorsport industry. And uh, I was dragged off to uh, what was then the RAC Rally, which was the national um, rally championship that we, we had in the UK, at about 10, maybe 11 years old. And I remember seeing the cars and seeing seeing a Lancia Stratus go through the forest with uh, noise. You know, flame, flames, the noise, and I was really hooked. I thought, wow, and this is really, this is mad. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that's where my interest as a youth sort of came, uh, even though I was really into to football, English football, and played that and rugby a lot. So it was a bit of a mix, motorsport. It wasn't on the Going television. Better like, at rugby, hey. let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but you... But you, you know, you couldn't get things on television then. You know, it was yeah. maybe, maybe a little snippet on the BBC on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> but it's not like now. You know, you can decide to watch anything anytime and have a replay. So yeah, it, it was very hard to follow sport in the same way as we do today. Yes. Um, but then, I, then I started off in my career. I wanted to work in the, the automotive industry. Mm -hmm. Ended up working in tires just because I felt tires went on different cars, so I could play with different cars and. Yeah. That for many years was the case. I was very fortunate working on all sorts of um, dream cars, luxury cars all around the world. And, so I know and then I remember I was, um, I, was, I was in Milan, I was working in Milan actually for the company um, and the, the big boss called me in and he said, look, he said, well, what do you know about motorsport? I said, well, I've not been involved in it, but you know, I do love it. It's a big passion of mine. And he said, well, we got a problem. He said, we don't seem to be able to run this business very well in, in the company. And he said, I think, it's it's an industry for the Brits. Um, you're the only Brit we've got in Milan, so oh, hi. <laughs> Here you go, have it. Uh, take take run it on. It, Giles, run with it. <laughs> it was a bit like that. He told me I was to make I it work. Baptism of fire. <laughs> so he said, sort of make it work or shut it. In fact, for the first years, we pulled out of circuit racing. He, he told okay. us to to not do circuit racing. We were very strong in rallying. I mean, we 
-hmm. When I took it on, we'd just been runners up in the World Rally Championship. Then we won the championship in mm -hmm. 2001 with Richard Burns and 2003 with Petter Solberg. So the rallying success and heritage of the business carried on. Mm -hmm. um, but then we started working at weekends and, and hiding our activity on circuit racing. And I remember we'd actually won a race. I think it was at Spa, actually, with a Porsche. And uh, the front cover of the, the Italian motorsport magazine had this podium picture. And there was uh, a, you know, these people with a Prelli hat on. And um, he rang me up. He was quite angry. He rang me up and said, come and see me. Come and see me. So I had to go and see him. And he said, well, how can this happen? I told you not to do any circuit racing. <laughs> I said, well... We thought we ought to give it a go. So he said, <laughs> so he said, well, does that mean we're, we're okay? You know, we're competitive. He said, I just hated the fact we, we weren't doing as well as we should have done and made ourselves look stupid. Well, said, well apparently we you weren't looking stupid at all. So he, he then took that as a positive and then over the next few years helped us invest in some new and bigger programs, particularly in the, the GT racing series. We had a wonderful program with Maserati with the MC12 car, which was a, it's actually a Ferrari Enzo derived car that was intended back in the, the mid 2000s to compete mm -hmm. against um, it was the Porsche Carrera GT and a Super GT Championship. And then unbelievably, the championship got canned. So we we're all left with these cars and not much to do. So, um, like M yeah, well, the MC12 did race, but it was a it was a little bit unfair because it was, um, you know, it was a hammer to crack a nut in many ways. So it, kept, <laughs> it kept getting restricted, you know, it had the aero restricted, the power restricted. Yeah. So it, it, a little bit of a shame, but it was a wonderful, wonderful program. And then it stemmed into obviously the big Formula One. Well, okay, that's, that's a really, that's a nice little story as well, because um, it was the, the same managing director, but I was, uh, I was based in Singapore at the time. I was still running the motorsport, but let's say more from an advisory consultancy. I was, you know, I've been doing it for so long, it was really eyes shut type of thing. Yeah. So I had a team back in Milan running it, but I was in Singapore looking after the Asia Pacific region. And I went to the first Singapore Grand Prix. And I remember sitting there, I got on my phone and I just loved it. I just thought the spectacle, I thought that everything about it was just wonderful. And I sent him a message, I said, Francesca, I said, look, I'm at the Singapore Grand Prix. We really need to be here. I just felt where the company was. I need to be here. <laughs> I needed to be here. I want a job. I want to be in Formula One. Um, I, I guess it was more, I just felt where the company was at the time. And it, it maybe had a few wilderness years in terms of identity. Projections. Yeah. Project and I just felt that this, this, this could be a breakthrough. We need to do something. And mm -hmm. lo and behold, um, less than a year later, um, I'm getting a call from Bernie Eccleston. Bernie calls me. I've always been in contact with Bernie. Yeah. He's... he's <laughs> Bernino, who's, who's adorable, and he, he told me, I was, I was due to go to Russia, I was due basically to go to Russia's, I was leaving Asia, and I was going to go to Russia's, the new CEO of the Russian business, and he said, no, 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 come and see me in London, I want to talk to you, I said, well, sure, I've got to come through, I'm on my way to Russia, so I'll come and say hi, uh, which is what I did, and he sat me down at lunch and said, right, Paul, what are you doing next year, and I said, well, what do you mean, I said, I'm going to Russia, he said, no, you're not, you're in Formula One. I said, no, no, no. Are you crazy? I said, what do you mean? I said, we don't have the money. We don't have the people. We don't have the product. We don't have the factory. We have nothing. What are you on about? You're mad. Exactly. And uh, he said, no, no, no. We, we, need, we need a partner. And he said, and I know you could do it. He said, I know you can pull this off. And uh, That's amazing. there we were. I want to have that kind of faith, you know, without. Yeah, it was really good. Well, we I mean, we knew each other. Yeah, we knew each other pretty well, but we never really worked in depth. I mean, we worked on a few projects together, but never, you know. But he, he just said, you know, I, I, I know you can do it. And this was in about March. And then in the October, we were in Abu Dhabi um, running the first test. So to build up a factory, we had no factory. We had no people. We, had, uh, <laughs> we, had no, we didn't even have the uh, trucks. We ground up. We'll be fine. But that was, that was a wonderful project because it shows what you can do if you, you really are focused. It went into, I guess... A, how, do you, how do you feel, like, just to kind of deviate a little bit, but the last week or so in Formula One, and I know you're obviously not ingrained in it anymore, but has been so topsy-turvy in terms of the changing of the guards in, in the drivers and, you know, Ferrari suddenly, Sebastian Vettel's out and it's just such a choppy changing kind of time so how do you feel about that and one other question i'm going to jump in there 
in terms of tyres and, and uh, fuel stops, I had a question come to me that someone wanted to ask you, which was, do you think longer races with fuel stops or do you think in the current climate of how the race is being done that fuel stops are just obsolete? Well, just quickly, I mean, they did get rid of fuel stops. Fuel stops changed, but tyre changes um, mm -hmm. have been happening. It was part of the strategy that, that Formula One wanted to, to integrate. Yeah. I guess compensating almost for the lack of fuel stops. But um, if you don't have them, unfortunately, it'll become a little bit boring. I mean, Formula One has a few issues that it's a bit repetitive. <laughs> and uh, that, that, that needs addressing, I hope, with the, the new regulations, which will now come in 2022. But... Mm -hmm. um, the, the change, I mean, every sport has changes, you know, people move on, move out. And I think uh, Ferrari have, have made an interesting change in the sense that, um, you know, a four time world champion um, yeah. moving on. Mm -hmm. But, you know, everyone has to come to, to a point in their career where it's um, do, do you go on or, or don't you? And I think Ferrari was looking very much to the future. Uh, they had an opportunity to sign Carlos Sainz, which, mm -hmm. which for me is lovely because I, I've known I've known him since he was about this big. Because yeah, I, I remember meeting him in, in Abu Dhabi. He's a lovely guy, very family orientated. Sweet. Yeah, well, I know his dad. I worked with his dad for decades, so it was, it was so he was he was he wasn't even walking I when think I first. He's going to become the new little pinup, to be honest. If he's not already. Well, his dad, his dad, his dad was actually like that. Yeah, he was always known as the real King Carlos. He was probably the first yeah. Spanish. <laughs> a Spanish superstar before the motorcyclist tennis players came along. He was the first real, apart from okay. the footballers, obviously, but the, he was he was a real icon back in the nineties. He, he broke through, so I, I think that's a nice choice. I think Charles is is uh, clearly an amazing talent, and I, uh, and I think actually Signs is is going to push him hard. Actually, I don't think it's going to be an easy ride for Charles because um, yeah. Carlino is 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 a very very talented driver. So yeah. I think. I like that I, because Ferrari kept going for older drivers all the time, the experienced drivers. Injecting some and, into the team. And I think that creates an expectation. You know, if you've got a four times champion, you're expecting them to go and win a fifth championship. Yeah. Whereas I think you get a sense of adventure and building something new when you have now two young drivers. Mm -hmm. And when they win, it's exciting. It's new. It's new. You know, Charles will always already won races, but it will be the... When, when he becomes a champion or even even Carlos you know he becomes a champion so and I think well, then you can say I'm you Aussie as you well know so yes. of course I'm pro Danny Ricardo. Yeah, great guy. Do you think you know he's obviously just a ball of talent and you know obviously has just moved um, to McLaren and do you think that there'll be the a, a greater opportunity for him to get the podiums that he probably has been deserved of in times gone past? Or do you think that it'll be the Ferrari teams going to, with that new injection of youth? Well, I think, you know, it would take a big change in, in performance from McLaren. Uh, they had a really awful year two years ago, a great turnaround last year. The team did a great turnaround. But, you know, to, to get in front of Mercedes, Ferrari and Red Bull would take an extraordinary effort, quite honestly. Um, and, I, I, I would be surprised if they've been able to do that. So I, I, I think he'll be pretty much battling where he has been, where he was with, with Renault. You know, Renault sometimes flattered to deceive. They, they, they had some races where they were really competitive and fast and then, then fell away. So mm -hmm. that, I think, is, is a to-be-seen. Of course, what Formula 1 season will we have? Um, yeah. I, was, I was astonished when they came out with a 15 to 18 race season back in mid-April. You an article that you uh, were <laughs> quite livid. I can't remember what the headline was, but I was like, oh, Paul, okay. You were very... No, well, I was, in reality, I was actually doing an interview on something completely different, and that came out about an hour before the, before the interview. Like... And uh, they asked my view on it, and I just was... I, if they were going to make an announcement, all they could make was an announcement to cancel the season. At that mm -hmm. point in time, there was, there was just not the knowledge. Of, of the current scenario with COVID-19 that you, you could be making those pronouncements. So I thought it was a little bit disingenuous because they would have known that as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I, and even now they're, they're still talking of a 15 race season mm. starting off in Austria, maybe one or two races there and they're moving to Silverstone. And, and you know, there's still huge questions there. We've, we've got a quarantine question going on in the UK. Whereas, you know, if you move out, when you come back, you've got to be quarantined. Yeah. Um, F1 starts saying that oh yes, but we'll create an exception and etc. But 
are they going to quarantine the people when they're back back at the factories? You know, there are seven yeah. Formula One teams in the UK. So does that mean they can't go home or are they going to quarantine all their families as well? Yeah, that's so, bizarre. You know, so where, where does it end that? And yeah. we've still got health workers without tests uh, available to them, or at least um, timely results and mm -hmm. equipment missing. It just feels a little bit early. And we've already seen with the, the, the Premier League football, you know, there's a couple of clubs that have had a, a few players that, mm -hmm. that have um, been found positive. Mm -hmm. And they're obviously scared. You know, these people have families, they have kids. And then some of them, are, we, we seem to have a, a, a bias towards certain ethnic groups as well in, um, in the UK, which yeah. is not clear. So I, I think there's lots of questions and people are going, well, mm -hmm. yeah, am, I, am I putting my, my whole family at risk to, to do this? So... And what's on, on that, I know prior we were having a discussion off camera in terms of uh, having left motorsport and having left Pirelli, now you have some really exciting new ventures that you're stemming into. And it's so pleasing to hear that a lot of those ventures that you want to do are, you know, are really about equality and about sharing wealth and wealth management of different companies and and how you want to strategically roll that out. So, Yeah, very much so. I mean, I've worked in the big corporate world and worked obviously in one company for a long time, so it's not really a comment against them. But in general, it, it's something that I've, I've seen that there just it's seems very... to be a poor, poor distribution of, um, of success, I, I guess. Mm -hmm. When businesses become listed, you know, the, the, the success ends up going to, to the shareholders. And some mm -hmm. will say, well, they've invested in the business. Well... The real investment only comes when you first do your IPO. That's when the cash injection really comes. And after that, it's a, it's a group of people in a, in a closed club doing, um, I call it legalized gambling. They, they tell me it's um, scientific analysis of businesses, but yeah, it's based on the balance. Correct term, yeah, exactly. right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, think there's, I think there's going to have to be a change in the, the social model going forward. I think there's a very, I see it. I, I work with a lot of young people. I really enjoy finding young talent, people that maybe don't have opportunity or they're maybe not living in, if you're in the UK, living in London, so in the spotlight, but in the regions. But I do find there's some amazing talented people out there. And, you know, and I, talent I in like, which sort of sector? Oh, well, a little bit of everything, but uh, certainly in the technology sectors, if you're looking at um, um, well, online businesses, which is what I've got at the moment, um, the setup there from the search engine optimization, content writing, uh, mm -hmm. the analysis tools that people have today. Uh, it's, it's, it's really is quite, quite impressive. And of course they, they have quite a different perspective on, on life and business compared to, to what, uh, I, I'm starting to sound old. I know, but it's uh, uh, sort of what, certainly to what I had when I was growing up, but I, I, I've always felt that, you know, one of the great things you can do is try and find you know, talent. That's always been one of my fun things in my career. I used to get, I used to get given people that other departments had decided weren't any good, you know, and in two years you mm. turn them around and then everybody wants them and they used to steal them back off of you. So it was a bit of a strange <laughs> scenario, but I guess that a is, nice that's a credit to you to be able to, to spot and then cultivate and nurture talent because a lot of people, A, don't have that patience, B, um, there can be that competitive nature of they don't want the new young up and comer. So it's kind yeah. of like squash it down. It's, it's hard that's to right. find that balance. So it's nice to hear someone like that's a very, That's a really, really interesting point because what, what I found in, in big business and big companies was exactly that you, you get a sense of insecurity from people. So mm -hmm. they don't want to have, as you said, young talent or, or talents coming in beneath them because yeah. they think, uh, I will be replaced. And sometimes with justification, some companies do think, oh, look, there's a young person there. They look okay. They can do the job of the other person for less money. So, and you do get moved out. And so that has created, I think, in a lot of scenarios, a situation where people have tried to hit down or be wary of, of talent. And on the other hand, people in the same peer group tend to be jealous if you have talent and then try yeah. to create problems internally you know most companies operate with competition internally it's not actually focused on the external competition um so you end up with that, that rather bizarre it's situation workplace dynamic it is and uh, the jealousy thing is, is huge because bear in mind a lot of people in a, in a big company only one person really makes the big money and that's the you know the, the ceo if yeah. you look at any company that's that's where you know the, the big money is the big bonuses etc etc so the majority of other people 
Um, then you get your sort of your next level management group where you get quite a lot of jealousy. They're, they're all fighting, hoping to be the next CEO um, <laughs> because that's where the money is. So anyone who looks half decent, they'll try their best to, to scupper their plans. Mm -hmm. And then when you're further down the chain, people are scrapping around just trying to get that job that gives them a 10% or 15% year pay rise. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're, they're fighting amongst themselves. So there's, there's a whole dynamic there that really needs a good rethink. And, yeah. and then, then you're told, you know, then you're scrapping and saving. You can't do this, can't do that. We've got to do cost saving. And the company announces, you know, it's watered down. X hundreds, watered X hundreds down. of millions of profit or billions <laughs> of profit. And you're going, well, hold on. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think it, it, doesn't, it doesn't foster a product or, or um, any type of business becoming more profitable in the end if you've got like that toxic workplace. It's, it's just unproductive. It is that. And um, I, I think there's, there's also going to be more where people, people just come and go now. I don't think the, the long term, I don't think, you know, people doing what I did 26, 27 no. years ago. No, it's going to be rare. I think people, and companies have created that scenario where people will just go, there's no loyalty. And mm -hmm. I, I certainly felt that change over the, the time I was working there, you know, that in the later years, the type of people and their behaviors were very, very, very different to say the early years, where you felt almost you, I'm not going to say family because it wasn't quite that, quite that wholesome, but it was um, this sense of a sense of belonging and a sense of um, being part of an, an extended uh, team or, or family. But that, that, that's changed in, in later years. And when I talk with, with other people who work in other companies, it's, it's, it's very similar across the yeah. board. It's not something that, is, is unique to where I was working is it's just the way society has become it's across the board. Yeah, absolutely. And so going forward into 2020, uh, are your, you know, your business is on hold for the moment or are you restructuring? Well, probably, you want to go about because, things? because yeah, because there are startups that haven't really affected it because we haven't really been trading. We, one of them just started really trading in February. So we're, we're really at the startup trying to find the correct, um, routes to market and the correct publicity lines. Yeah. Uh, putting together partnerships. We were in the process of signing up, for example, with a, a major hospital group for one side and some Incredible. quite quite notable sportsmen on the other from brand ambassador point of view. So all of that has been ongoing. I think the biggest problem is, and I think for a lot of people, is, is basically cash flow. You know, if you had things that you were buying and selling, yeah. it's, it's yeah. not the time. If Asset you're trying to, rich and cash flow. Exactly. So that's, that's, that's been the challenge for myself. And I know other businesses that I know mm -hmm. is that they maybe have assets or assets that are probably worth 25% less now, but yeah. uh, um, so that, that, that has led to a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, but having said that it's opened up opportunities with working with um, let's say other businesses that can help, help us in our growth that are maybe not as swamped with uh, other options as they had before. So a little bit keener to, um, yeah, talk to talk to us or give better deals so they say with crisis comes comes new opportunities i think that was like the you know the war time and what came after or what came during war times were often companies that settled in for generations to come so i, I feel a little frustrated i haven't quite met that opportunity but you're quite right there's a lot of i mean you imagine if you're involved in uh, logistics businesses um today then everybody home shopping they, they've yeah. had a huge Massive I'm not a huge home shopper at all. I'm much more a, a consumer that likes to go in. I need the tangible. I need, I need to feel a fabric. I need to see things. I've never been an online shopper. Yeah, so I'm feeling I, very deprived right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've you got to hope that those shops will still be there because the high street, if there's going to be a big change, obviously it's going to be in shopping habits. I think that yeah. that's probably going to have changed now forever and the high streets of um, cities around the world will be decimated in terms of physical retail locations and yeah. the hospitality yeah. industries as well, you know, and, and hotels and mm -hmm. holiday locations. That's going to be a, a tough year. Big hit, you know? massive hit. Yeah, definitely. Well, on that note, <laughs> I will thank you so much for all your, you know, your thoughts and, um, sharing your stories because I think it's such an interesting time where people instead of you know uh, for me on social media and uh, you can scroll through 
photos upon photos upon photos, but a photo doesn't really necessarily tell a story. I think we're all looking for that human contact now and people want to hear people's stories. They want to hear a voice. They want to get to know the person. And, and that's why I started doing this um, series because I just felt like there's so many people with such interesting stories that aren't necessarily that I'm friends with. So I thought, and you were, you were someone that came up and, and I thank you very much for joining me. On this. That's a pleasure. Yeah. And uh, hope, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get to meet up when we're allowed to travel again. And uh... Yes, and share some of that lovely penfolds. <laughs> oh, yes, definitely, definitely. <laughs> I won't need you any. Hold me to that one. You can hold me to that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again so much, Paul, for being here. That's great. Thanks very much. I really appreciate Bye -bye. it.